video, but yeah, whatever. Why not? <laughs> right, hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our in house session of QABC. Um, I've got, I think we've got a few new faces here. Hello, welcome. If you've been in before, and we've got a familiar, familiar face, and I think it's two, three, four. I believe. Yes, online. Yeah, it's just, just a black square. <laughs> Okay, um, yep, so welcome. I'm going to go through a little bit of um, our code of conduct. Uh, this is very much always a safe space. Um, it's always a free event. If someone tries to charge you, just say no, because we're going to ask you for money. But no, if you want to, just say no. Um, everyone is welcome. Don't get your background, you're always welcome to come here. This is a universal thing. Testing is a universal thing, so everyone is welcome to it. Please be respectful to others, to one another, to the presenters, and obviously we'll give that respect back to you as well. Basically, behave yourselves. Um, and also, please don't try to interrupt the presenters while they are talking. Obviously, we've kind of got a flow presentation we want to go through. Um, if you do have a question, um, please wait for the opportune moments like Ken or myself to say any questions. Yep, yeah, please save it for there. Um, if you report anything to Ken or myself, you think something's been said that maybe took an offence to us, something's not quite right, please let us know, we'll kind of resolve it or have a chat, please come and speak to us. However, if you do continue to break these rules, unfortunately you will be banned from future events. Thankfully we've not had to do this yet, I have no intention to, but as I said, please behave yourselves, especially you. I'll try. I know. Cool. So what have we got planned for you today? Uh, from myself, a QA overview is basically a few examples of different types of testers and also a QA analyst, what we would do. And then followed by Mr. Fulton, a professional photo. Yes, he'll be going to how to do some ticket writing, which is an essential part of the QA as well. So, the couple ones we're going to go through. A manual tester, automation tester, non <coughs> tester, if you've never heard of them, I've given a little explanation on that. And lastly, kind of the main role I'm going to talk about is a QA test analyst. So, a manual tester. Have you all heard of a manual tester? Yep, we'll put some sound effects over. Yes, that's fine. Yes! Yes! Um, so, what does a manual tester do? Uh, they read and understand the software project itself. If you don't know what you're testing, you don't know the product, it doesn't really make any sense. Always know your product first. Uh, review and baseline the test cases. This could be with a product owner, a dev, a client, where applicable. So, you might talk about test scenarios or do a handover for testing. Execute the test cases themselves. Maybe you can in a language that's maybe known as acceptance criteria or a cucumber, it's like a given when then. Given, I click a button, when the button actions, then the action will happen. Um, use correct testing tools. Um, yep, yeah, there are so many testing tools out there. Um, if you go onto our YouTube channel, plug it in. Yes, you'll find a previous story from myself and Ken where we've gone through various different testing tools. Like Ghost Labs, one of my favourites, is where you can test multiple browsers in one go, including on your desktop and your devices. So you can test one web page for about three browsers and maybe two devices on the browser as well. So rather than spending an hour doing each one, you can do it, spend an hour just doing one, They're doing seven at one. But again, that's sort of been covered, but again, go on our YouTube channel, all our information, demonstrations, as well as are there. Um, reporting bugs. Essential part of the manual tester's job. If you find something not working, it's your kind of responsibility to make sure you report that. But again, how you report it that is quite critical. Just do not go to a developer and go, excuse me, uh, you've done it wrong, go and fix it. Go and speak to them saying, hi, I found this uh, defect, can we talk about it and what we need to resolve? Or it might not even be a defect related to that certain scenario or feature that you created. It might be something that I've been uncovered. Again, it's how you speak and report the bug. Again, yep, once the bug has been fixed, uh, execute the failing test cases again to verify that they are passed. So you do what's known as steps to replicate. So given I do this, 
When I click on that, then it's supposed to action. So again, you can write in the given when then scenario, or you can do bullet points. I do bullet points. That's another point we need to um, to write in tickets as well. So that is my little tester. Automation tester. Uh, yep, to convert manual tests into scripts. What I mean by this is basically you can either do it via code or you can use a tool, what, again, what we've covered is Selenium ID, is a point and click system, is where you basically manually record something in and then you can just then play it back and play it back by a touch of a, bu a, touch of a button. So, say, um, a user journey might take you, say, 15 minutes to manual do. If you've automated it, it'll take you couple of seconds, that's how quick it can be and it's very efficient as well. However, converting those into automation can take a bit of time, but in the long run it does save you time. Uh, choosing the best automation tools, as mentioned, Selenium IDE and also one of our, our favourite tools is Cypress. Again, if you look at it on YouTube, Mr. Fulton again has done a very good showcase on Cypress. Over, th over, <laughs> over three slides, it was quite a funny day that. Um, yep, reporting any failures. Again, if a test fails with a new feature, again, you report that as a bug or you report that to your developers or talk to them again what went wrong. Rerunning re re the scripts to verify that they have passed, but also to pass that they fail as well. You can write an automation that purposely fails. If it passes when it's meant to fail, then obviously something is wrong. Uh, yeah, retain the test scripts, always got to keep them up to date with latest releases or new features. And then, yep, includes back end and white box testing, like white box testing, good lord. And another, another presentation will <coughs> cover white box and black box testing as well. Sorry, that was going to be my, uh, my question was, what is black and white box testing? We shall cover that in another session. Oh, we've got this lined up. <laughs> non-functional tester. Does anybody know what a non-functional tester is? Sorry, it's quite your hand if you don't know. That's absolutely fine, don't read it. Okay, go to what non-functional tester is. It's basically, you can do some sort of testing thing that's non-functional, is the best way of putting it. Um, my best examples of non-functional tests or testers are performance, load, accessibility, capability testing. Um, I don't have my laptop, so I can't see my notes. Basically, a performance tester would be, is how quickly does a page load? So again, yeah, it's a good session we've done before, it's on Lighthouse, very free and simple uh, tool to use. Performance test is, for example, does, how long does a front page take to load? If it takes about 20 seconds, it's going to get a very poor score. However, it will give you a report, so you can go back to your phone and go, look, you've got JPEGs that are about 10 megabytes big, you need to sort that out. Redo the performance test, that's gone from 20 seconds to 10 seconds, then you know that test is working. Your load testing is how many users, if I remember correctly, hit a website. So does the website perform with one, with one user? How does it perform with a 10, a 100, a 1,000, the whole world, the universe? That's your load testing. Accessibility, if one will then do in the future, we have done before, is if someone's got, um, if someone maybe who is blind has got um, poor eyesight, or they are deaf, is there alternative text on the website for them to see? Does the box reader, I think it's called box reader, is Chrome's inbuilt software, is like can someone hear it properly? So if you're scoring less than 90, yeah, you probably have to report that. That's not good. And yeah, then feedback or improvements of any books as well. So, QA analyst, where do they begin? in the, what's known as the development life cycle. Here? Here? You never this animation. Here? Or even here? So, have we... Yes, we've got most of this to out. Absolutely fine. I'm going to place these right here. And a nice little bit of audience participation. I was absolutely prepared for this. So what I'd like you to do, grab a post it, you've got blue, green, orange to choose from. What I'd like you to do, with, with, with a post it on this, imagine this is a professional Kanban board, where you think in the development life cycle, the QA's role would begin. 
a few moments later. Okay, got a nice little bit. So we got, yep, people think they begin with testing. Makes sense, yep. We've got a testing at the end of the day. Uh, when it comes to review to stakeholders, yep, makes sense. You've got to then hand that over. However, QA role, well done to all of you. You answered, yes, starts in backlog. Now, the reasons I can see on your cubist little minds is like, why does a QA's role stand there? Well, kind of our job description is to be QA quality insurance analyst. So, QA analyst, why do we start in backlog? Basically, you can get so much more done by asking the right questions at the very, very beginning. It's like, okay, we have this feature. Why does it do that? Okay, does it do this? Is it supposed to do that? This is, you get all these questions out long before it's come to you. So, you imagine it's got all the way to test and you ask this and the other, then you've got to stop it there. Why, when you can do that, when you can do it right at the very beginning, talking with your product owners, the clients themselves, depending if you're working with agency or you have close contact, working with developers as well, ask all these questions there and then. This is again where you can start building that relationship with your developers as well, which is a good thing, working through progress, testing, and even review. When you start doing your demos, handovers to your clients, you've talked about it already, should, should be a nice, smooth flow compared as where bit more of the waterfall methodology, we actually just hit testing, that's it, no, stop it right there. Again, because you've already spoken to them in the backlog, you've got those questions out already. All bugs have already been thought about and captured even sooner. So, your analyst, execute or even delegate exploratory, automated smoke and regression tests. If in short, what a smoke test is, that is basically a user journey test. Can a user get from A to B? without any features breaking or they can't complete their saying go to top shop let's shut down now all right let's use asos uh, can they <coughs> go to basket add basket purchase if that bit of the smoke journey if the smoke test is broken you have an issue um, analyze um, actual results against the expected one this is where the expect acceptance criteria comes in given when then report box and retest one and uh, once fixed your manual or so you automated demonstrate to stakeholders so again you've talked to them in the backlog you've got them to sign off what the product and features going to do you've tested it you're happy with it you go to review you go to the table right i've got this to demonstrate to you are you happy with it if they say yes boom ready to release perfect again collaborating with all disciplines within the team you have your product owners personalities developers stakeholders Everyone is involved. This could be even with a semi like Free Amigos. Create test cases and sets of test cases to govern test conditions. Gather, sorry, create and gather necessary test data, which is very important, to support the test cases. You don't have to have any data to test against, kind of defeats the object. And also, and the final good point, which I will hand over to Mr. Fulton, is writing user stories and acceptance criteria for tickets. Uh, note, I shall hand over to Mr. Fulton before that. I should say, are there any questions? That was a lot to throw at you, I understand, but I tried to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> you have any questions? Yep, please ask me now. If not, forever. Always. Does everybody understand that? There should be one more question. Excellent. So I'll put it I need to. Is that the one? Is that one? Yay! All right. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, have I got the where's the little red thing? Oh, oh, there it is. Hold on. Um. All right. So, can you hear me? Is this coming through fine? Do you know? Yep. Yeah. Fine. Um. All right. I'm going to talk about uh, ticket writing. Not just about ticket writing. I'm going to talk about uh, requiring uh, requiring requirements gathering. God, I can't talk today. Um. So before you even start writing tickets, writing stories, I don't know how people have done this before, whether they call them tickets, whether they call them stories. I call them tickets. It's, it's simpler that way. Um, 
we need to actually go through and uh, find the requirements out for what, we're, what we actually want to do. So I'm just going to go into a little bit of backstory based around this of why we do this now. So we've evolved as testers. Um, I was talking to you guys before about you know how things have changed so much over the last 20 years. So 20, 25 years, 30 years, what would happen is you've got a tester that will sit all the way at the very end. It will sit on this side. On that side, you've got, you've got planning, you've got development, um, and then you've got testing at the very end. The problem that you've got with testing sat at the very end, that if something messes up badly, it's got to go all the way back to planning to get fixed again. So we've changed how we worked, how we actually work right now. So what we do here at Code and a couple of other, other com companies as well is that our testers are fully embedded within a team. Going back 20, 30 years ago, what used to happen is that you know, we got handed testing work. Someone would come over with a big script and say, this week, you're going to be testing this. And they'll just go through a checklist and they'll tick it off as they go along. Pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, fail. Um, we don't do that. We don't get handed test scripts. Um, we're not handed work. We actually go out and we work with our development teams to make sure we build the correct things up. This is why we're talking about writing tickets, writing stories. Um, we sit there and we create the development stories, not just us by ourselves. We work with the development team. So we'll come up with, we'll get the designs or wireframes. We'll break them down. We'll take away the functional requirements based around that. Um, and then we'll put them into stories and we'll work with our developers to make sure that we've got the correct information on that. If I talk too fast, let me know, okay? Because I just, I just talk really fast. It's where I'm from. I'm from Liverpool. We all talk fast. Um, so as I said before, we've shifted from left and we've shifted all the way over to right. So we actually work at the very front. Now, when we get designs, we get wireframes. We actually help to plan out these stories, these tickets with the information from wireframes or designs. Here at Code, we use a simple system that's called um, LeanKit. Now, basically, if you have a look at that board over there, it's pretty much that, but it's an electronic version of it. What you've got is you've got your release ready for release, acceptance tests, what's in progress in development, uh, and then you've got what current sprint's coming up. And further down here, you've got your backlog. We get involved right here at the backlog. <coughs> Things come in, we look at them, you know, and we make sure they're right. So this is a t an example template of what we actually use. So we've got a title on there. We've got a user story. Uh, we've got context based around what it's going to be about. Uh, we talk a little bit about compliance as well, whether you're looking at GDP, GDPR, where you've got personal data that might get used by someone. Is that going to be a risk? We always have this on there as well, just to make sure that we can tick that off and say no. Um, we've got PCI and security. So whether you're doing anything with um, account login systems or anything like that, we can always put this on there to make sure that you know we follow the correct things to make sure we don't mess up that way. Um, we've got our basic acceptance criteria on there. So we have write this in given when then. Anyone ever heard of given when then? You've, you've heard of given when then. So given when then basically is our acceptance criteria. It works of you are in a, you are in a position. This is where I am on a website. Uh, the when is when I perform an action on this website. And the then is the outcome of that action. So we're always constantly building these up as we go along. Um, and then at the bottom, we've got, you know, impacts that's going to happen, uh, supplementary information, so links, content, test notes, who owns this ticket, so we could change it over to different people as we go along. So, you know, it's being developed, so the developer will have their name on that. Once it's handed over to someone else, the tester will have his name on that, just to make sure the people that it's gone to as well, just basic tracking as well. Uh, and then at the very bottom, we have tags and attachments. That seems like quite a lot, but it's not. It's really not. It's really simple because some of these things, like the compliance, you might not need that for certain tickets, so you'll just scrap that off and say you don't need that. Um, impacts, it might just be a color change. Is that going to be an impact on a website? Not really. It's just a color change. You'll scrap that off. And as you go through, you start filling up this script, basically. And what this script does, it helps the developers understand what that piece of work is for. So I'm going to give you an example, and I'm going to get everyone involved in this one because this is the, brunt, the, the, the big part of all of this now. So let's just talk about user stories. So with a user story, um, what you want to make sure is that when you're building something, it's actually going to have a business value to a client. Color change, you're not going to get a business value out of that at all. You know? But someone in the business might want that. You know? But is that going to be value to someone? 
you know, are you going to get money from that one? So you've always got to have that question based around business value. Um, context here, you'll have your requirements, and we'll go through requirements in a minute. Um, and then you've got your acceptance criteria, as we've just spoke about as well. So I'm going to do a task, and this might take up quite a lot of time. So I'm going to do the task, and I want everyone involved. So what I've got, I'm the owner of... Is that a fly? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm the owner of Toyland, so I'm, I'm the CEO of Toyland. I've got multiple stores across the UK, um, and I want someone to be able to search on my website for the closest store that they've got right now. So we've got this nice little search here. However, when you enter the search, this is your output. Okay. So what the task that we're going to perform today is, we're going to go through this entire page and we're going to pull out the requirements of what we're going to test as well. So that's the first part. So I'll come to each of you. You know, I'll write on the board, and what we're going to do, we're going to talk about requirements. Have a look at this. Ask questions as you go along, and we'll write down some requirements. And then from that requirements, we'll actually start building up the acceptance criteria of what the developers are going to build as well. Does that make sense? Anyone got any questions? No? That's great. I like it when people have not got questions. All right, so, Chris, do you want to come and do my writing for me? No. Come on. Yes, tell her that wasn't a question. No, it wasn't a question. <laughs> All right, so let's focus on, we'll focus on the first part. We'll focus on the actual search box at the very top. So I don't want to go one-to-one one one and just say, well, what do you think, what do you think? So put your hands up if you think, what's the first requirement we've got in Toybox? Or Toyland search box. Anyone? The area. The area. Yeah. Okay. In, in what? What do you mean the area? So you're talking about the output. So if I search for Manchester, yeah. we get Manchester coming out. Yeah. That's fine. I, that's that's first one. That's great. All right. What what else about the the box? Anything else around here? Yeah? Yes, I think the text box should be active. The text box should be active? Yeah, maybe you should accept text. So, you want to search for Manchester, you yeah. should be active. You know, you know so maybe some situation you will be trying to, to type and it will accept the text. Predictive text? Yeah. So it's like you, you put like M A N in there and it will drop down with yeah. Manchester, things like that. Predictive text? Yeah, a lot of search boxes use that right now. Uh, that's actually a really good one. I never thought of that one as well. That's actually really good. Um, anything else on that one? Yeah? The circle locator button, is that a button or is it just a picture? That's a really good point. Is it? What we see right there, that is like, you know, the geolocation. On your phone, you press it, it finds out where you are and it'll show you the closest things around you. Geolocation, Chris. Uh, in fact, it does accept postcodes. We've got it up there. Enter your postcode or location. So there you go, postcode. So you've got postcode or location. So it accepts multiple different things. If it doesn't understand what's been put in, what should be shown? That. <laughs> oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, that, that's a really good point. Error state. What are you getting involved for? You know this stuff. All right, any, anything else we've got on the actual search itself? What search logo and search for? Okay. It shows you the direction. So are we... Are, are you talking about these? Yeah. All right, we'll move on to that next. But I think you're right there as well, so yeah, we need to look at that as well. So you say the search box and that search icon, do they both do the same thing? Yeah, so that's fine. So yeah, that's a picture, that's a button. You know, I'm, I'm CEO, ask me questions about it. You know, this is the type of thing, it's because what I tend to do is, my, my entire team, we don't sit there and wait for our PMs to come along and say, this is a wireframe, this is how we're doing it. What we tend to do is take them wireframes and we'll go to our clients and we've got clients from around the country, and we'll go to them, we won't drive down there, we'll phone them up and we'll just say, all right, we've, we've picked this up, um, you've got this little magnifying glass here, 
uh, what is that? You know, is that an icon or does it do actually something? So we're talking to them about, you know, is this a piece of functionality? They could turn around and just say, no, it's just a logo, just to show people that that's a search box. You know, it's like, all right, fair enough. We don't need to do nothing with that. Just say, the icon's there. Matches the design, that's it. Anything else on this? If you can't think of anything else, that, yeah? I think something obvious would be that when you click each one, the, the map appears correctly and the information appears correctly. You're getting ahead of everything now. You're, <laughs> you're getting ahead. Let's not do that. Let's, all right. So for, for this one, you're completely right there. That is, that is correct. So for this one right now, uh, I don't think there's anything left on there. I can't see anything. We've pulled out a couple of things that I didn't think of when I started putting this together, which predictive text. Yeah, that's great. And then you've got, you know, like talking about the error. The errors as well, you know, what happens if you put something in there that doesn't make sense? You know, gobbledygook, you put that in there, you know, it's not going to find it. What about ambiguous terms? If you've actually put in something into the search box there, and it might match multiple locations, what should the behaviour be? So if you're talking about a wide range. All right, so... Because you just say by location, I mean, that could be... A street. You, what you counts as a location? Street, town, city? Well, well, you know, it just says location, so it could be a street. You know, if you're using a predictive text search, as we've, we've spoken about, that'll come up and it'll say, oh, well, you want Manchester, oh, Manchester in the USA? No, 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 Manchester in England, and it'll come back with that. That type of stuff. As in, like, yeah, Queen's Drive, do you mean Queen's Drive Liverpool or Queen's Drive Hesel? Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, predictive text will be able to pick that up as well. Um, all right, so let's... Let's move on from this one. Uh, let's have a look at let's have a look at the little cards at the side. These ones here. All right. So, what can we do with this? What func what functionality or requirements are we going to gather from these cards? So we've got two cards: one for Manchester, one for Liverpool. Our search is Manchester, but we've got no other ones in Manchester. The next closest one is Liverpool. Oh, cards. Cards. So, what would you look at within this card? What would you want it to do? Look the, the miles away um, that is good, because I think it's the closest one. Yeah. No, you're, you're completely right there. You know, we would test that as well. It's like, you know, if you want to search for something, if, like Chris said before, ASOS. Is that online? It's an online. I don't know. I don't. I look at the way I dress. I don't do, do online shopping. Is it online? I don't know. Let's say Superdry. Superdry's got shops. Yeah, Facebook, uh, yeah. and, and you go on their website, ASOS, sorry. You go on their website and you say, you know, I'm in, I'm in Manchester City Centre, where's the nearest ASOS? Yeah. You know, when you put that in there, you wouldn't want to say like, oh, the, next, the, the closest one's like 37 miles away, you know, when there's one in Manchester. It's that type of thinking that we want. It's just like if you select a location, you're expecting if a location is close to that shop, you'd get a response back. So yeah, that's, that's correct. You want to make sure the miles are correct for what it is. Um, I've, I've recently done testing on something very similar to this one, where you set up the actual miles of uh, geolocation of something as well. You've got to actually test whether that the geolocations that you put in match on the other side as well. So if you say, uh, these coordinates are for the city centre of Manchester, however, they're coming back as uh, Oxford, then you're just like, all right, that's, that's really broke. That is really broke. So you want to make sure that that shop is coming back correctly for what, where you're searching for as well. So yeah, you are right. Miles. Come on. Carry on. Uh, anything else? Yeah, Through these cards? Yeah. Of course you can. Of course you can. As you can see at the top, we have got this nice little red border around it. That means that this one has been selected. So yeah, you're right. So you can swap through it. What were you saying before? The fact that the direction is right. Yeah. And it brings up the right direction. That's it. That was you as well. It was you as well. Sorry. Sorry. But you are right as well. So. Opening closing times? Uh, that's a really good point. Um, they're not down on the card, so maybe. No, not at this point, yeah. Something we might factor in at a different point. But that's a very excellent question to go back to your designer and just say, how come we've got no you know, opening and closing times? You'd want to see that, wouldn't you, on a search? Contact number, okay. You, you, he's not even got past the first one yet. All right, so let's, let's go back. So you were saying about you can select the cards. Yeah. 
So first one is select the cards. So the first thing to do is select the closest one to you and it'll give you options of what the next ones are. These are the requirements that you ask your clients, you ask your team, you work with them on this as well. Anyway, um, so yeah, so we're talking about clickable cards. So you click on Toyland Liverpool, we then would expect the map to change. We'd want that map to go all the way to Liverpool and show you precisely where it is. Uh, right now it's 45 miles away. When it moves over, it'll probably shorten that down to where it is. No, it wouldn't actually, because you've done a search for Manchester. There you go. Mm, that's true. Uh, next thing you were talking about, what was it? Contact number. So we've got a contact number on there. All right, so we've got that, and it's a different colour. Why is it a different colour? Go. No, not for the different colour. That's a different question. Why is contact number a different colour? Oh, exactly, that's it. You know, what we've got to do is make sure that when we build things out, we build them out on mobile devices as well. We try and do uh, responsive websites. You heard about re responsive, you probably heard of a responsive website. So responsive websites is you build it out as a desktop and when it gets to certain screen sizes, it reorganizes the page so that it can be viewed on certain screen sizes. So we try and build out responsive websites. Now that's perfect I, thing that you've just said there because when you go on this in mobile view, I've not got the mobile view designs, I didn't bother doing that. Um, you'd expect if you click that telephone number, it dials through your phone. You know, you, you press it, you go, you open, yeah, no, you're not, all right. So that's it, yeah, clickable, clickable phone number. So that's saved in the direction. Yeah. Exactly. That's Google Maps. There you go, that's it, yeah, exactly, that's it. These are the questions you need to ask in your team. Now, you've got a question, go on. I was going to say, um, does a store only always have one phone number? Does every store have a phone number? Does some stores have multiple phone numbers, and how should that be shown? Uh, just one number. But, excellent question, you know, you want to ask that because, as you said, you know, you could have multiple ones, you could have a, a, a main office number, you could have a shop floor number, you, you know, do you want to display them type of numbers on there, or do you just want one main number? Questions you actually do need to ask on this. Um, di direct You're going to do this all day, aren't you? Go. How long can the address be? And oh. what does it look like when it wraps around? Is there a maximum size? That's a really good point. Yeah. So wrap around text as well. Do you guys know about wrap around text? It's like Sorry. It's Basically, yeah. So if you if your text is really long, if you go down to a small screen, how does that wrap around? What does it look like as well? Does it break the actual design on a mobile device? Now, what was that? What's that Welsh town called? Uh, you, you know, the one with the big long name. Oh, I went there this week. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> it's really long. It's a really long Welsh, Welsh name. Now, if you have that on here, it'll probably go all the way over and wrap onto that. Now, if we get a mobile de de design of this and we, we, we shorten it down and it's a smaller block, how does that wrap around? Does it actually come out the sides? Does it break the actual components itself? These are questions that you need to ask as well. <coughs> You had a question? I did. I was not going to ask, but I really would like to know. Yeah. So, if you, what happens if, based on your where you put in, that you have two toy stock toy lands in equal distance, which one takes priority over the other? That's an amazing question. That is an amazing question. Um, I've never seen that happen before, down to the actual, you know. Yeah, you might have to figure it out. Like, you might have to figure it out. Well, you know, it's a really good point. Uh, what, what happens there? Did he, who goes on top? You know, is it then alphabetical? You know, is uh, Toy Story Manchester go over Toy Story? No, Toy Story Liverpool go over to Manchester if they're an equal distance apart. You know, questions like that's a very good edge case as well. I never thought about that. That's a really, really good edge case. Um, so now you could take away from that as well. You know, think about that. Yeah, it's really good. Um, all right. So, any other questions on this? We haven't covered the view more button. Yes. View more, all down here. So, what happens? View more. Good question. What do we do in a view more? It shows more cards. That's supposed to be darker, that. That's supposed to be a card. I don't know why that's blending in the background. Um, accessibility. Yes. You'll do talk on accessibility soon. Don't worry about it. Um, 
So when you click on that, it's going to bring up more cards. What you've got to think about then is, how many more cards? Is it going to be 20 more cards, 30 more cards, 50 more cards? The only reason I'm saying that is if you've got a mobile device and you click view more, you don't want like 50 different stores showing on your phone because you just got to scroll through them all. You don't want that. Um, so how, how do we deal with stuff like that? You know, just have a limit there. Sorry? You just have a limit, like miles away. Yeah, you can do. That's one of the things you talk to your developers about that. You know, like, all right, well, um, I've done a search for Manchester. Should Liverpool really show up if it's 45 miles away? Who's going to go all the way from, if they want Manchester, go all the way to Liverpool? For Toyland, you know, search Liverpool then. You know, you do have to have that mileage limit on there. You might just say, in Manchester, you're looking at the radius of Greater Manchester, which is... 50 kilometres. Kilometres, we're talking miles. Well, it doesn't say what uh, distance is it? Does it say kilometres or miles, does it? Am I? Miles. Yeah, back in your box. All right, 15 kilometres. Let's, let's say 14 miles. I know that's wrong. I'm really off on that one. Um, so you so you got, you know, we don't want to go show any more for 15, 15 kilometres, 14 kilometres. Miles. Miles it is. So let's say you'd have one in Stockport. That'll still come under that size. So you'll have, you know, Toyland Stockport. So yeah, you are right. You know, that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that we test all certain things like that. And you get these questions out, these requirements down for when you're building stuff out. Any other questions on this one? Or any other things you want to point out or talk about? We've got Manchester, but where in Manchester is that going to get cheaper? That's a really good point. So every map should have a pinpointed location of where every city centre is. So you'd have a look on geolocation for Manchester on Google Maps. If you just type in Manchester, it'll put a pin right in the centre of Manchester. So you might want to use that, or you might say, you know, something, let's use our Toyland Manchester one as the dot. That's where it is. Most people won't do that, though. But it's a good question to have. Really good question. So in a sense, like, you know, this postcode is 2.9 miles away. You put Manchester there, you might get the other side of Manchester. Where is that location starting from? That's what you're saying. Exactly. That's it. So if you've got something like where you're saying, well, I, I want to look here at Toyland Manchester, I can understand that working when you do geolocation. Because it's like, well, I'm, I'm right here. Yeah. This is my location, and it's 2.9 miles away from me. But if you're not, if you put Manchester, where's the starting location? This is a question to go back to your developers to ask, you know, where are we pinning this from? Because this has come up in the, I think it happened at late rooms where we had something very similar. And um, the area was actually crescent shaped. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a straightforward blob or square or anything. It was actually crescent shaped, which meant that if you actually worked out where the center of it was, it wasn't actually in the area. So it made a, yeah, this direct, the distance from the center of the area meant nothing because the area was such a weird shape that the center meant nothing. In fact, the center was not in the area that it was supposedly the center of. So yeah, it's an excellent question to go back with. Yeah. What does that even mean? It looks good in this sort of design, but what does that actually mean? It's only got 2.9 miles, but is that a straight line? Is it by car, walking, cycling? Mm -hmm. Is it crow flies? Is that by road? Have you heard that, by the crow flies? Uh, it's a, a simple term from, if you're going from point A to point B, crow flies is straight across. So it's like you just fly there. Whereas, you know, if you're going by car or if you're walking... Is that travelling London? Yeah, miles is like two hours. That's it, yeah, exactly. One of the good examples of that, we all go back at the neighbouring days, is where if you do it in Surrey, you have to go to Blackpool or something like that. You really like look search by hotel in Preston, but it's like right, we're going to Blackpool. Oh, it's only five miles away. Realistically, it's not because you're not going from there to there unless you want to swim. Yeah, you've got to go all the way around. Like you were saying, it's that's about thirty to forty miles. So you have got to know what that what that point actually represents. I think the case now is always as the crow flies. It's just a generic. Can you change it? But then that comes from the actual directions, get directions. So as you were saying before, we've got 
directions here and here. What do we actually do with that? It's clickable. As you can see, it's got an underline under. If I click on that, what's it do? It takes you to Google Maps. Yeah. Oh, on your phone, it, it tells you the fastest route, do not it, and how many miles it is. Yeah. It shows you how to go. Which so way you want to go, you can choose. Kind of we, we don't have to build that. All we've got to do is send the coordinates and just say, here's where I am, this is where I'm trying to get through. Get to. Show me it. That's it. It's going to be part of the testing, it's going to be linked to Google Maps, part of third-party integration. Does it work? Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. This comes on to the last part. We've got a map. Got a lovely map here. In terms of requirements, what are we going to look around with this map? Is it correct? Is it correct? Yeah. Is it showing the correct location? You know, it'd be terrible if it was showing Toyland, London. You know, that's miles away. That's, that's, just, <laughs> that's completely broke. You, you know, you can't do that. You know, it's not working. So, yeah, you want to make sure that the map's correct. Anything else on this one? You know, is the pinpoint right? Is is Toyland Manchester in the correct geolocation? There you go, yeah, you've got pinpoint map. Yeah. Anything else? Does it show the main roads? Yeah. What's the main roads on it? You know, is the you know, we've got it right here on fake road. I don't know what fake road doesn't exist. You know, is it showing the correct main roads? You know, what type of map is it? Is it a Google is it powered by Google? It, what else could it be powered by? There's another one. There's Bing, um, OpenOS, I think, as well, but probably not going to be that. So there's, there's multiple different maps that can get powered by it as well. You want to make sure it's shown the correct. See, three words is now becoming more popular. Mm. That's, you, rather than being a map, you get a three-word location. That's very popular. Three-word location? Yeah, you get three words. Yeah. Three words is yeah. quite a location. There's a really it's a good advert for it at the moment where I feel like Amazon is going to a wrong address. A woman's clearly dressing his clothes that's meant for him. Obviously, because they get it wrong, so he's now tagging his address with three words, three random words. So, yeah. yeah. Basically, with three words, you can tie yourself down to a couple of metres squared yeah. anywhere in the UK. And that's unique to you. Yep. Oh, I learned something as well. That's great. That sounds weird. It is. Anyway. <laughs> Um, one of the other things that we probably want to do with this as well is just make sure if you're on a mobile device, you can actually scroll around on it. You know, all right, well, I'm all the way over on this point. How far away is that? You, know, you want to zoom in, zoom out, move around the map as well. Um, another question. Um, if I select a different Thailand store on the left-hand list, should the map on the right move to that location? Yes, it should. What about uh, level of zoom? If I've zoomed all the way out, should it reset the zoom back in? Yes, it should. You know, if you, t if you zoom all the way out of Google Earth till you're like at the moon or something like that, if you click on Liverpool, you're expected to zoom into, you know, a location. So what you want to make sure there is you've got a set, low, a set zoom within your um, whatever's powering it to make sure that it's, you know, it works correctly. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, any, again. What do we do if Google Maps is down? Um, if Google Maps is down, then... Get lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's a really good point, but how many times... It's third-party service. How many times has that happened, though? I could go and check if you like. <laughs> However, you know, in, in terms like that, if Google Maps doesn't show, what you can probably actually do is not save up that, the map, but you can still save up your cards. It, tells you, it still, still gives you a telephone number of it. You can phone the store then. Can you click on that box there so you can actually see the map? Good point. I never put anything on there, but yeah, it's something that you, you possibly can do. You might want to say, well, I know where it is. Or even if you click on that box, does it do a smaller little circle type thing? You know, like one of the pins that you get? So just make it smaller. Yeah, make it smaller so the information's hidden. And you've got that little pin there. There's a, there's a lot of sites that do that right now where it's like, what is it? Uh, you search for like restaurants. Um, and it comes up with a map and it's got all these little pins in it and you click on it and it'll do, do that box. I think I'll just find it annoying if you can't say that app. Yeah, I find that that happens quite a lot on the internet and you can't, well, I personally can't announce it. Yeah. Click off. Is the information attached? Yeah. 
want to make sure that you know like if you click on Manchester it's coming back with all the same things on that these two should be powered by each other or that should be powered by this card yeah, yeah information matches Any anything else? No. All right. So one thing from this as well. These lines should be clickable to take you actually through to the Toyland Manchester page. You might have a website that ha that's got multiple different stores and they have multiple different events going on. You know, my Toyland. You know, in. Manchester's got a Lego event on. I might want to purposely show that off on its own separate page. Liverpool might have different events on at different times. I want to try and show that to different people. These are different stores. So we might have these as clickable links that go out to the correct page so that you can have a look at them. You'll get more information there, you know, uh, better address, better map, you know, more contact information. Maybe you can email them out as well. You know, things like that, social media links. It might be powered by people that work in them stores as well. Um, so yeah, these would be clickable as well. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, got that. Anything else? Yeah. And um, so if we've gone through, we've selected a store and we're looking at a map. What happens if we then go at, back into the search bar and change the? Place? You change the location. Oh, you do another search. Let's say you do leads. What we'd expect to happen there is that you have leads cards and a leads map. It updates the map. That's what it does. Yes. Does it update automatically, or do you have to press enter or search? Ah, uh, that's a good point. That's a really good point because what you've got there is like you look at the likes of look at Amazon. You're on Amazon Video and you want to search for a video. When you start putting like the letter A, it comes up with a big loader list of letter A movies. You then enter D, it comes up with A D list like that, and it builds up a list until you narrow down your search. You could do it that way, or you could just have a drop down. You click on a drop down, and then it updates for you. Or you could just type Manchester in and press search. Multiple different ways you can do that as well. It's how you want to do that. You'd have that conversation with your team, your developers, find out the easiest, bestest solution to be able to do that. I don't really like the drop down predictive, you know, one at a time because it slows everything down because you've got to do a call constantly to the database. I used to have a an address search and I was the only person in the team that really hated it because you typed it in and it automatically like if you typed in your postcode it automatically jumped to like the next bit whereas I would always press enter and by pressing enter some people would say that should submit the page but then I'd end up just all over the wrong places so it was just like if I wrote leads like would it automatically go to leads or do I have to press enter to trigger it? And these are the conversations you have with your team to, to make sure that works. And that's probably going to be not just an annoyance with you, if that's a live thing that's out with people. I tried. I did. I tried to find data that would back up my point, but I couldn't do it. But I failed. It turned out it's just I use websites strangely. <laughs> that's, that's great, though. That's, that's, that's the unique side of it. They're the edge cases that we want to try and work on. You know, that may happen to, like, two out of ten people, but two out of ten people still quite a lot of people when it goes to the thousands. Quite a lot. Yeah, they say CEO had an idea for a function to work, but then how the actual user uses it might be something completely different again, that's where we can come in. And that user is like, actually, no, I'm not going to use it like that. So, like you say, it kind of frustrates us then. Yeah, yeah, we might be sure to use it as well. I mean, we, we, we have a voice now, you know. We don't sit there with the test scripts and someone says, test this. Make sure it works like this. We can sit there now with the very start and just say, this is shit. It's not going to work like that. <laughs> it isn't. You know, you're not going to do a predictive text search is when you put L-E-E. -E, it starts searching for it. You know, you want to finish it off. You want to select something, make sure it's right. You know, what about if you start typing in leads, but you try typing in a leads address? It's a big address. And then it's starting to go through all these things and it's doing updates and it's saying, oh, well, no, you wanted 2.9, now it's 10.5, now wait, now, now it's 5. Point, because it's constantly updating and that's going to slow everything down and we don't want that. Um, but yeah, that's a really good, good point. That's a really good question. Anything else from anyone? You. <laughs> um, what happens if someone comes here with a screen reader? Like, how do they navigate around this? The map is obviously useless, some of the directions would be useful. 
if they select individual boxes, what actually gets read out to them. That's a really good point. That, that's an excellent point. Accessibility. That's going to be in a different uh, conversation. But yeah, I've, anyone used screen readers before in the past? Um, really good. So we, we, we advocate as much as we can about accessibility. Inclus build inclusive websites for everyone. So what we want to do is anyone... Does anyone know about how the system works behind a web page? You probably do a, a little bit. Yeah, you've got, to, you've got to tag them correctly, and you'll have, like, you know, you can... Someone with a screen reader, what they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll tab through the different elements on the page. So each one of these would be an element. So this, this box, this is going to be your first box. Within that is going to be another element in there, which is going to be search bar. And what you've got to do is you've got to make sure each one of these sections that you've got here, search bar, search button, geolocation, card one, card two, each one of these are tagged up correctly with the correct language as well. If someone with a screen reader is tabbing through and they land on this search bar and it doesn't say nothing, it's just like enter text, they're going to be like, what the fuck does that mean? You know, <laughs> that's it. What Enter text for what? You know, but you want to write it in a way where it's like, um, it could have this text, looking for storyline close to Rome, enter your postcode or location, and your nearest one, that could be what it reads out to them. They type in their nearest postcode, um, press enter, or they can navigate to search by using the tab button. They can do it that way as well. There's a lot more on screen readers that we'll probably get into further down the line. But yeah, that's a really good point. You know, the map might not make any sense to people at that point. So yeah. Anything else? We're only halfway through the, the, the task. Only halfway through the task. All right, that was great. That was great. So we've gone through, we've, we've got a lot of requirements that we want to talk about. However, that's quite a lot to go through. So we're going to break it down. We'll break this down into smaller tickets. I'm not going to build three tickets out for you. It's, it's going to take too long. We're going to pick one. We're going to pick one of these, and we'll go through, and we'll write up some acceptance criteria. OK. Go on, write it. Go on, you've been good. You, Debbie McGee, come on. <laughs> All right, so what, what, do, what, what, should we, what, what should we do? What should we do as an example of writing out some acceptance criteria? Ticket one, two, or three? Uh, one. Ticket one. Okay, we'll take ticket one. Uh, first person shouted up is going to be ticket one. So what we're going to do, we're going to build out this search component into a ticket. And we're going to use a system called given when then. We spoke about given when then before. Uh, given is where you are at that current area. When is the action you're going to perform. And then is the outcome that you're expecting to get. So <coughs> given. All right. So search bar we've got. What would be our first given? Okay, so let's go back to the first the, the list. I think it was the first page. <coughs> never planned this, did he? I never planned this. <laughs> you want some post-its? Post well, let's see. Let's see. This is you know. Let's test it. Here you go. Look at this. You know, that's great. <laughs> you know, we we do things on the fly. There you go. That should stay. Yeah, you keep hold of them in case they fall. <laughs> All right, so flip that over. Um, given when then. All right, so what we've got over there, we've got our search results um, of what the outcome is going to be. We've got predictive text, we've got geolocation, postcode location, and error stats. How do we want to start this? So, can someone give me a given on how we can start writing these out? Yeah? Maybe we can say the user is on a complex web page, the starting point. The starting point, okay. Let's say, let's call it a search page. Maybe, yeah. Let's call it a search page. So our given would be, given I am on the search page. That's, that's, that's as basic as it is. You don't need to go into full detail about all of this. You know, you're telling the user, you know, this is where I am. This is the location I am. Right, that's fine. All right, so let's do the first one. Let's do search results. So the when. So what am I going to do? 
you know that I'm on the search page, what am I going to do? Put your postcode in, that, that, that's perfect. So when I enter my postcode, all right, what's our outcome going to be? What are, we, what are you expecting to take? Gives you the closest one. Close, close, okay? The only reason I'm saying close is you are right, but all you've done is just entered the postcode. You've not done anything else. Your action is typing in the postcode. What we could do with that is we could look at the next one down, which is predictive text, okay? So we've got two ways we can do this. First one is uh, you could press enter, and then you'd get the search results back, or you could get the predictive text and select from that. So let's say we press enter. Let's go with your one. So do an and, get rid of them. Do an and. So you can we do an answer? We've got to do and, you know, because that's still part of the process. So and, I click search. Yeah. Then. Sure. Yeah, then. You're going to be a then now. You only want one and, you don't want too many. It looks stupid then. And then, what's the outcome? What's the outcome? You know, we, we, we're doing a search for a postcode. We've clicked search. Yeah? Display nearest location. Display nearest location, there you go. You've done a search for my postcode, and you're displaying the nearest location to that postcode. That's correct. There you go. That's, that's basically your first acceptance criteria. That's what you're gonna do. What you can do with this one then, you can duplicate this. I don't want you to duplicate it. Down here, right and. Not on my finger. And. <laughs> and then. Um, I click on the predictive text outcome, output even, then it'll display the nearest Toyland location. It's the same thing, it's two, two different things on that, but you're getting the same outcome. You're searching for a postcode, you'd either select search and it'll just search manually, or you select it from a drop down, predictive text, you get the same outcome, that's it. You've got, already got two on there right now. Anyone else got anything on this one? We've got a couple more on there. Uh, you can also do the given steps with, uh, given on the search page, and there is a toy land within 2.9 miles of my current location when I put in the current, when I do a search on the current location, then the toy land within 2.9 miles appears on the list. That's within 2.9 miles. But isn't that from a, a location, geolocation? Yeah, it was more just uh, the more control. You can actually specify more and more step uh, preconditions in the given steps. Yeah, 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 you can. You don't have to have ands after the whens. It can be after the given. It could be after the then as well. Because you might say, uh, given something's displayed um, and it's the correct information, something like that you could have. But you are right, you could have different ands at different points as well to actually build these up. Get rid of that and, just real, that's what I would have written, given I put my postcode into the search box, when I click search, then, so then you would have been more key than kind of like, oh, so then you just get rid of the and, you do one less part. Oh, that's fair enough. You know, it's, it's different how people yeah. write it, and as I, I said to you guys before, it's like, you know, this is from my experience. Chris's experience is different. He writes them in different ways as well. Um, all right, let's 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 do one more. I've, I've been waffling on for you know quite a long time now, actually. Um, let's let's uh, let's do error stuff. Error stuff stuff. Error stuff. All right. So how are we going to break it? How are we going to make sure that if if we put something in there, it's going to tell us that it's wrong? What will we do? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. You don't even need to write that one down. Did everyone hear that then? It just says not recognised. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can define what the message says. But well, you're completely right. It's like if I enter an incorrect postcode or an unrecognised postcode, you get a message telling you that it's wrong, and nothing's going to get displayed. You know, you're not, it's not going to bring back a map, it's not going to bring back any of the cards on the side, it's just going to display a message and just say, 
yeah, this this doesn't exist. You didn't have to write that down, Chris. All right. Um, all right. That was a really good one. What about last one? We'll do last one and then we'll move on. Um, geolocation. How would we write acceptance criteria for geolocation? Would you just would it would there not be something there as well to say nearest closest to you? You just click on it. One. Could be, could be. So let's let's we'll remove these, let, ignore these. All we've got is that little search box, haven't we? So we've got this geolocation button. So we know on a mobile device it's a button. So given I'm on a mobile device, when I press the geolocation button, what happens? So I'm singling you out there. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, it just, I don't know. It brings up the closest one to you. That, exactly. That's it. You, you're completely right. You know, when you actually use that, it's showing you this is my location. It's where I am. It's going into your device. It's saying from GPS, you're here at this point. Where's my nearest Toyland store? And it's 2.9 miles away. It's really close to it. You know, spend money in my store. It's great. All right, um, any questions? Why is it always the Riddler? Because oh, he's great. Always in your slides, it's the Riddler. I know, I know. You, you're lucky, you're lucky because he's not skin tighty in this one, this time, you know, crouching down, so yeah. That's... I mean, it's still a disturbing. It's still a disturbing picture, but it's always the Riddler. It'll always be the Riddler. Jim Carrey's Riddler. All right, so any questions are on this at all? Yeah? Um, so do normally QAs write the acceptance criteria or is it the QAs. Well, it, it depends on your team, really. You know, for me, I'll sit with my team and we'll talk about the requirements, like what we've just gone through. I'll take notes. I'll write everything down, what I'll do. I'll go away. I'll write out the tickets for it. So... When I showed before on that, I'll break them out into three separate tickets. So it'll be like, you know, if I got a Toyland search, these are my acceptance criteria to prove that this works. You know, all we want is that to spit out. We don't want it to spit out these. We just want it to spit out. It could just be a crappy list of, you know, lines. That's it. This is all we want to do. That's just proving that you enter something, it, it comes out. I tend to just take that information away. Um, I'll break them down into the correct stories. I'll write the acceptance criteria up. And then I'll sit with the developers and say, this is how it's going to work. And then they'll take them, that work away and they'll work on it. Well, it should be stressed. It's, it's you, but you've discussed it with the stakeholder. Yeah. So you can ask those questions. So you, do you know about Three Amigos? Yeah. Three, three Amigos. Do you guys know Three Amigos? All right, so you know Three Amigos. You don't know Three Amigos. All right, so basically what Three Amigos is, within a development team, you'll have three main people that work on stuff. You're going to have a developer, you're going to have a tester, and you're going to have a stakeholder or um, a, a PM. Let's call them a PM. Um, the PM's got all this information off the stakeholder. At any time, you can go off to a stakeholder and talk to them about it if you want. But you will three will get together to talk about this work. You'll talk about the requirements, um, and you'll hammer out these details like that. And we call that a three amigos session and you hammer out all the details then and then you come back to the team and say, I've done this, like that. But we predominantly write the tickets out to ourselves. So you don't need everyone around you, you can do it yourself. So yeah, three amigos. I thought you raised your hand. Then I no, no, it's just stretching my head. All right, so any other questions? I'm going to keep showing you this. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> what an episode. Um, again, there are different ways that you can write acceptance criteria. So, um, what can, can demonstrate that you're doing it as I would as a user, but again, there's a good. Who is it? Faith used to work in did a group presentation on writing it as a third person with acceptance criteria, or you can do it as it's just a user's thing. So, it's something to bear in mind again. But what I'm saying is how you feel comfortable by doing it. Because you kind of like. The I is already done kind of the user story. As a user, I want so that the I is already there. Again, that's just enough to take like, to our acceptance criteria. Yeah, this is not me saying that. 
this is what you should do, this is how I do it from my perspective. It works. You know, I've done this for a long time, so it works. Um, anything else? Yeah? Yeah, sorry. On average, how many tickets do you write daily? Uh, daily? Are you talking about? It, it, it fluctuates on different days. Um, if we're doing, let's say, let's say two week sprint for like probably about two days, I'll be busy writing tickets up. And then for the rest of it, I'll be working with the developers on um, testing their work, getting demos off them and testing what comes through on my side as well. Um, if you're doing weekly sprints, it might be a smaller batch of work and you'll probably spend like half a day just writing things up that way. So yeah, it depends on how your team works. That's it. But you wouldn't expect to write, you know, constantly every single day. It'll probably be like a bunched up couple of days dealing with that. Yeah. Sorry, do you have a figure in mind? Very average. It's it's difficult. On my on my project right now, which is weekly, I'd probably get through fifteen tickets a week. Or write up fifteen tickets a week. Um, but they could be from like really small things to something really big. So it depends on weekly. So yeah, every team's different. Yeah. So what about you? What about you, Chris? On average, weekly, what? How many tickets do you write up? <laughs> this week so far, I think I've written about seven. So see, so it fluctuates. So by, probably by Friday afternoon, you've probably write, written about ten, eleven. Some could be like, you know, a one line, you know, of, you know, this is one acceptance criteria. You know, you could get like, you know, a design change, and all you've got to do is say, you know, given one this page, does it look like the designs? That's it. So some can take a few minutes and some can take a long, long time. Depends on the complexity of it. It's like with that stuff, you know, we've gone through it really quickly. Now let's just have a look at what we've got on there. That will probably take a while for us to write up, you know, because more questions come out as you start writing them up. Again, very good question again. Chris is like, what point in that acceptance, acceptance criteria where you then kind of go, this is a different ticket, this is a different story? That's a good point. That's why I broke these down into three. You know, we wouldn't deliver all, you couldn't deliver all that at once because there's too much in there, there's too much risk. Do you know about risk and value? Um, what, we, what we try and do is we, we make the smallest, t the tickets as small as possible because it negates risk when we go live with them. If you were to release all of this like that, the risk is going to be huge that something's going to break. You know, we're not robots, we can't find everything. You know, things will slip through the gaps. You know, no code is 100% defect free, it's not. No matter how much you think about it, it's not. So we tend, when we look at all of that requirements there, it's like, yeah, break it all down, break it all down. For the first one, all you need to do is just like, the only thing you want to see as an output is a line of text that just say, yeah, is Manchester and is the closest ones to it. That's it, you know. Can't release it like that, but it's a start. So yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> any, any other questions? That's great, great. I'm not going to ask again because I don't want to keep talking. Um, all right, so um, 